We should never despise little faith. Any faith, however small, is a gift for which we should be thankful. And Jesus makes it very clear, as we saw last time, that even little faith can accomplish remarkable things. But no believer should ever be content with little faith. Welcome to Open the Bible with Pastor Colin Smith. I'm David Pick. I'm glad you could be with us today. And Colin, why do you think that no believer should be comfortable with just small faith? Well, because the challenge of the Christian life is so very great. The story that we're looking at today, the disciples are left reeling from what Jesus calls them to do in regards to forgiveness. And then they're confronted by a challenge that they're simply not able to meet. And it leads them to say, Lord, increase our faith. Well, these experiences will be ours as well. And so the prayer of the disciples needs to be ours as well. So we'll continue to look at that prayer and what it means to have growing faith as we turn to Luke 17 and begin growing faith. Here's Colin. Now, last week we looked at five occasions in Matthew's gospel where Jesus spoke about little faith. And on each of the occasions, Jesus was speaking to his own disciples. It's almost as if he used little faith as if it was a kind of middle name. Oh, you of little faith. And from these five stories, we saw five reasons for growing in faith. First, because little faith is ineffective against anxiety. Second, because little faith underestimates the ability of Jesus. Third, because little faith is easily distracted. Fourth, because little faith forgets what Jesus has done. And fifth, because little faith gives up too soon. Now, we should never despise little faith. Any faith, however small, is a gift for which we should be thankful. And Jesus makes it very clear, as we saw last time, that even little faith can accomplish remarkable things. But no believer should ever be content with little faith. And we saw from the occasions that Jesus spoke about little faith, five strategies for us today to grow in our faith. We saw last time that faith grows as we seek God's kingdom, that faith grows as we get to know Jesus, that faith grows as we worship, that faith grows as we are nourished by the word of God, and that faith grows as we persevere. Now, someone might reasonably ask at this point, now, are you really saying that if I learn to worship and if I immerse myself in the word of God and if I persevere in serving the Lord and walk with Jesus, that I will be less anxious? And the answer to that question is yes, absolutely. You'll not overcome anxiety completely. We live this life in the weakness of the flesh. And that means that we always battle against fears and against temptations. But the more you grow in faith, the more you will prevail over anxiety. Grow in faith and you will overcome stubborn sins. You will break through dark strongholds. Grow in faith and you will be more focused and you'll be much less distracted. Grow in faith and you will persevere. Now that's what we've learned as we started out on this four-week journey of growing in faith. Today we're turning to Luke and chapter 17 where the disciples asked Jesus to increase their faith. And here then we come to a sixth strategy for growing in faith. And it's very obvious that faith grows as we ask of Jesus. The apostles said to the Lord, increase our faith. Now notice that Luke says that it was the apostles who asked this of the Lord Jesus Christ. They had left everything to follow Jesus. They were in what we would call today vocational ministry. These are men who had been sent out on what we would call cross-cultural mission. They had preached the gospel. They had healed the sick. 
They had cast out demons. And yet here these men are, the apostles, saying to the Lord, increase our faith. Well, if the apostles asked Jesus to increase their faith, how much more should we be asking of the Lord Jesus that he would increase ours? Now, here's the question that gives us the trajectory for the message today. What was it that caused the disciples to ask Jesus to increase their faith? What was it that convinced them, we really do need to grow in faith? What was it that led to them making this request of Jesus? And what will lead to us making this request of Jesus too? Well, I want us to see four things from the context today. And the first is that we should ask Jesus to increase our faith because we will be tempted. That's the first thing. Look at verse 1 that shows us what led to this request of the apostles being made to the Lord Jesus. Jesus said to his disciples, temptations to sin are sure to come, but woe to the one through whom they come. Now, the word that is translated temptations here is the word scandala, from which, of course, we get our word scandal. In other words, Jesus is saying here to his disciples, scandals are sure to come. Now, a scandal, of course, is something that causes offense to another person and causes that person to stumble. And Jesus warns the disciples very clearly that it is an inevitable and an unavoidable part of life in this fallen world, that scandals will come. They're sure to come. That's what Jesus says. Now, it may be that some scandal, a behavior that has hurt and wounded you, has caused you to stumble and has hindered you in your own walk of faith. That's exactly what the Lord Jesus is talking about here. Perhaps someone who professed to be a believer, someone perhaps even who had been appointed to a position of leadership in a church, and then they behaved in a wretched way. And it led you to say, well, I don't think I can believe if this is what faith looks like. Now, Christians will always be grieved where there are scandals. They will break our hearts. But we should never be surprised because Jesus says scandals are sure to come. You are going to have to face this. There will be stumbling blocks that you need to get over. That's what Jesus is telling the disciples here. And of course, throughout the history of the church, this has proved to be true. Now, does that mean then that we should simply shrug our shoulders and say, well, dreadful things happen, and that's just how it is? Well, not according to Jesus. Look at what he says. Temptations to sin are sure to come, but woe, woe to the one through whom they come. Jesus says it would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were cast into the sea than that he should cause one of these little ones to sin. Now, you could hardly have more grave or serious words of warning than these. The natural meaning of of little ones, of course, would be children. And it is certainly true that those who abuse children, those who traffic children, face a fearsome judgment and an awful condemnation. But Jesus spoke about those who believe as being little ones. And it seems likely that Jesus was referring here to the sin of causing someone to stumble in his or her faith. Matthew Henry, in his helpful commentary, identifies three kinds of people who fall under this terrible condemnation. First, he says, 
persecutors, that is, those who offer any injury to the least of Christ's little ones, those who persecute believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. Then he says, secondly, seducers who corrupt the truths of Jesus Christ and so trouble the minds of disciples. In other words, people who insidiously move those who believe away from the truth, corrupt their minds and their hearts. Persecutors, seducers who take people away from the truth. And then thirdly, he says, and I quote, those who under the profession of a Christian name live scandalously and thereby weaken the bands and sadden the hearts of God's people. Weaken the bands simply means cause disunity. Sadden the hearts, bring grief to God's people. Oh, says Matthew Henry, those who live under the profession of a Christian name, but live scandalously. They bring division to the people of God, and they bring grief and sorrow to their hearts. Woe to them, Jesus says. God will deal with all who harm his own children. Those who lead them away from the truth, those who hurt them, those who cause his children to stumble. Scandals are sure to come, says Jesus, but woe to the one through whom they come. Now, Jesus is clearly issuing a stern warning here, and he gives this warning to who? To us. Pay attention to yourselves, he says in the very next verse. In other words, don't think that I'm talking about other people here. I am giving a warning to you. You are my disciples. You are the ones who bear my name in the world. And with your calling, there comes a great responsibility. And when the disciples heard this, what did they say? They said, Lord, increase our faith. Give us, in other words, the strength that we need to stand against the temptations that we know we will face. Increase our faith so that we will not be the ones who cause others to stumble. Now here then is something that every Christian leader needs to hear. Here is something that every believer needs to hear because we all bear the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. God cares about his children, so pay attention to yourself and be very careful that you do not lead one of God's little ones into sin. We've got to pause our message there, but we'll be back in just a moment. The message is called Growing Faith, and you're listening to Open the Bible with Pastor Colin Smith. The series that Growing Faith comes from is called Growing in Faith, Hope and Love. And if you ever miss one of the series or if you want to go back and listen again, you can do that by coming online to our website, openthebible.org.uk. There you can hear any of the messages which have already gone out on air. You can also find us as a podcast, and those podcasts are available on all the regular podcasting sites. You can find them either by following a link from our website or by going directly to the podcast site that you prefer and searching for Open the Bible UK. Subscribe to the podcast if you want to receive regular updates. Back to the message now, we're in Luke chapter 17. Here's Colin. Ask the Lord to increase your faith. Ask him because you yourself will be tempted. And then here's a second reason. Ask the Lord to increase your faith because you are called to a holy life. Now, I want you to notice what Jesus says here about the life to which we are called as believers. Verse 3, if your brother sins, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times in a day and turns to you seven times saying, I repent, you must forgive 
him. Now notice that Jesus challenges the disciples here with a double responsibility. The first is, if your brother sins, rebuke him. Now these words of Jesus are very similar to the words that he spoke recorded in Matthew chapter 18 and verse 15. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault. Now, does this mean that there is an obligation to confront every sin that you see in every other believer? Answer, absolutely not. There are other scriptures to consider and to weigh before you go charging off to rebuke your brother for some sin or other that you may have seen in his or her life. For example, 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 8. Love covers a multitude of sins. Or Romans chapter 12 and verse 18. If possible, as far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Or Matthew chapter 7 verses 1 through 3. Judge not that you be not judged. For with the judgment you use, you yourself will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not see the log that is in your own eye? But when all of this is said, clearly this scripture is pointing us to the fact that there will be times when love requires you to confront a brother or a sister who has wronged you. When should you consider doing that? Well, several translations of um, these words include the words against you. Bible translations such as the NIV translate this, if your brother sins against you. And that clearly is the meaning here. And it's stated clearly in Matthew chapter 18 and verse 15. And it is stated clearly in verse 4 where Jesus says, if he sins against you seven times in a day. So Jesus is not talking about sin in general. He's speaking specifically here about a wrong that has been done against you, that has affected you, that has hurt you directly and in a personal way. Again, the context here is important. Jesus says, pay attention to yourselves. In other words, when a brother or sister sins against you, you need to be very, very careful that you yourself are not drawn into sin. Now, the principle here is especially clear in the Old Testament, Leviticus in chapter 19 and verse 17. Let me draw your attention to this important scripture. God says, you shall not hate your brother in your heart. But you shall reason frankly with your neighbor, lest you incur sin because of him. Now, what is this saying? Well, when a brother or a sister wrongs you, you will often find that you are simply able to pass over it and to move on. And if that is the case, thank God for that. But sometimes, if the wound is deep, you may find in your own heart that you're beginning to struggle with resentment towards the person who has hurt you. Now, notice the logic of this verse that speaks to that situation. God says, you shall not hate your brother in your heart. You must not allow your heart to go there. That's not an option that is open for you as a believer. So, if you find resentment towards a brother rising in your heart, what should you do? Well, you should go and you should reason with him or with her frankly. Why? Lest you incur sin because of him or her. In other words, 
lest the wrong that he or she has done leads you into the sin of hating them. Now, that's when you're to do this. How are you to do this? Well, notice what God says. You shall reason frankly with your neighbor. Isn't that a beautiful expression? Reason frankly with your neighbor. Dale Ralph Davis, in his commentary on Luke's gospel, catches the spirit of this. He says, rebuke does not mean telling him off. It does not mean reaming him out, but simply disclosing the wrong that he has done. And of course, reason, frankly, also means that you must hear the person who has offended you. What does he or she have to say? And, you know, when you hear them, you might learn something that would give you a different perspective, a fuller picture of what has happened. Now, the aim then of this honest conversation, this confrontation that takes place here, is that help will come both to the person who has caused the offense and to the person who has been offended. And again, Dale Ralph Davis points out that the clear implication of this very striking verse in Leviticus chapter 19 and verse 17 is that expressing rebuke tends to dissipate inward resentment. And that surely is why Jesus tells us that this is something that in these circumstances we should do. If your brother sins, rebuke him. That is our first duty, but the second one is much harder, and we'll hear about that next time. So I hope you'll join us for that. Our message today was called Growing Faith, and it's part of our series Growing in Faith, Hope and Love. And if you've missed any of the series so far, or if you miss any in the future, you can always catch up or go back and listen again by coming online to our website, openthebible.org.uk. There you can hear any of the messages which have already gone out on air. And you can also find those messages as a podcast, if that's a better way for you to catch Pastor Colin's teaching. And those are available either by following a link from our website or by going directly to the major podcasting sites themselves and searching for Open the Bible UK. Also available as a podcast and on our website, you can find a daily reflection series with a new one posted every day, and that's called Open the Bible Daily. It's based on Pastor Colin Smith's teaching and read in the UK by Sue McLeish. Many Christians find it's a great way for starting the day. Open the Bible is supported entirely by our listeners. That's people just like you. And if that's something you're considering doing, this month we have an offer for you. If you're able to set up a new donation to the work of Open the Bible in the amount of £5 per month or more, we'd love to thank you by sending you a copy of Kevin DeYoung's book, Impossible Christianity. Colin, what would you hope that someone reading this book will take away from it? Well, Kevin DeYoung does a brilliant job of distinguishing between the life that God calls us to lead and the sometimes impossible burdens that we place on ourselves. And that's why it's such a helpful and such a liberating book. For example, when he talks about prayer, he talks about the importance of prayer. And anyone who really walks with the Lord knows that. We often feel that we need to pray more. We can live under a burden of saying, have I ever prayed enough? And have I ever prayed as sincerely and deeply as I ought? And we end up putting burdens on ourselves that can easily make following Christ feel like a joyless experience. And so I found impossible Christianity to be really helpful in just restoring a sense of perspective, a sense of peace to the soul, and it's right out of the scriptures. It's faithful to what God says, but it brings to us a sense of a life that is made possible by the grace of God as we follow hard after the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, we'd love to send you a copy of Kevin DeYoung's book to say thank you for setting up a new donation to the work of Open the Bible in the amount of £5 per month or more. Full details of this offer are on our website, openthebible.org.uk. 
For Open the Bible and Pastor Colin Smith, I'm David Pick, and I hope you'll be able to join us again next time. The apostles asked Jesus to increase their faith. What led them to ask for that? Find out next time on Open the Bible.